Okay, the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. First, our schedule for May will be posted very soon. Um, but to give you a couple of highlights, I won't go through the whole schedule. But we, we are conducting on Monday, May 13th, our general advisory committee meeting here in this building on the fourth floor. That is open to the public, and that starts at 2 p.m. And then on May 15th, we're going to be hearing from um, VITAL and their budget, as well as getting a primary care advisory group update. And then we're also on uh, the 15th of May having our primary care advisory group meeting at our offices at 144 State Street. Again, open to the public. That starts at 5 p.m. And lastly, on May 29th, we will be traveling down to Randolph and Gifford Medical Center for our traveling board meeting. We're looking forward to that. Um, also, want to let folks know that we have a couple of job openings at the board. They're posted on our website. Um, we're looking for a director of health systems finance as well as a health policy analyst position. Uh, I can say for myself it's a wonderful place to work and we'd welcome folks uh, sharing that information for anyone who's interested and then last we have a sign-in sheet out back for people coming to the meeting but then there's also a comment a column if you are interested in providing a public comment um, if at the end of our presentation when public comment comes up and you haven't signed in I'm sure that we can accommodate you but if you are interested in providing a public comment it would be helpful if you put your check mark next to your name and that is all I have to announce today thank you Susan the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Friday April 19th is there a motion second it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday April 19th wait what am I talking about Wednesday Friday April 19th <laughs> without any additions deletions or corrections is there any discussion Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So now we're going to move right forward with Springfield Hospital's enforcement discussion. And we'll turn it over to Agatha and Lori to um, just set the uh, stage. Great. Thank you. Um, so my name is, oh, first I'd like to reiterate Susan's point that it is a great place to work. And we are great people to work with. <laughs> so with that said, I, I love that. <laughs> uh, my name is Agatha Kessler, and I'm joined here with Lori Perry. And um, our coworker, Kelly Thoreau, is not here today, but substantially contributed to um, what we're presenting today. And I believe she's listening on the phone. So thank you to Kelly. Um, just briefly, you have a full afternoon planned for you. Um, first, we're going to go over Springfield's FY18 year-end results in the context of an enforcement hearing, an enforcement discussion. Springfield will then get up and, and present to you, and then um, the board will deliberate and potentially vote on their enforcement. Then after that, we will turn to the second topic today, which is their request for an am amended budget order related to a charge request, an increase in their charge. So staff have a presentation where we, Lori will give you their, um, our recommendation, and then the board will deliberate and potentially vote. So moving on to, I think, there we go. This is the enforcement discussion. Um, this is the sixth time you've seen a setup like this. Um, this is the sixth hospital we're reviewing this enforcement season. So first we'll look at their year in results, then we'll look at their um, year to date results for fiscal year 19 uh, as of February 28th of this year. We'll look at a few slides that have um, year end results for a couple of buckets that we track, NPR, operating expenses, operating margin, and total margin. Then Springfield will come up, they'll get sworn in, you'll have a discussion with them, and then the board will deliberate. So this slide here, um, we have a few slides prepared. This slide here shows the net patient revenue, fixed perspective payment, and charge requests for the last two years. And across the board, for both NPR and charge, the board has approved Spring Springfield's request. So you can see in FY19, they requested a little over $59 million, which was approved. And in FY19, they requested a little under $60 million, which was approved. 
um, and the percentage change is, is reflected on the screen. Then for charge in FY18, they requested a 6.5% charge, which was approved. And most recently in FY19, they requested a 5% charge, which was approved. And later on today, you'll see there's an asterisk here indicating that on March 27th, Springfield did request an additional 5% charge, um, which will be discussed later this afternoon. So this slide here is very dense, um, and we're going to take a little bit of time kind of walking through it. Um, the purpose of this slide, this slide is not necessarily sequential, but it is meant to illustrate the timing um, of when information was submitted to the board. So there's been a lot of questions about when things were submitted to the board. So this, this slide is meant to kind of provide a little clarity to the questions sur surrounding timing. So first, we'll go over the top portion. There's basically three portions. The top portion is the budget to actual, which shows how the hospital performed compared to their budget, their budget that was submitted in, uh, or that was approved for October 1st, 2017. And this is why Springfield is here today, because they came in at a minus 10.8% variance on their NPR FPP. For operating expenses, they came in above budget by 3.5%. On the right-hand side, these are the three kind of financial indicators that staff like to take a look at, the board likes to take a look at, which are operating margin, total margin, and days cash on hand. Now, these figures are a point in time as of September 30th, 2018. So on that day, which was the last day of the fiscal year, they had a minus 12.8% operating margin. Uh, we also have it reflected in dollars. It's about minus $7 million total margin. Um, of minus 12%, did I say total margin? Total margin minus 12%, which is about minus 6.6 .6 million, and they had 47 days cash on hand. And all this information is coming from um, the adaptive planning tool, which is our database. The second part of this, the middle portion here, is their FY projection that was part of their FY19 budget submission, so part of the annual budget submission, we ask the hospitals for a pr an update on their projection for the current fiscal year. So when Springfield presented to the board on August 29th, um, these are their projection figures that went with their submission. So you can see here, this is the budget to projection variance on NPR FPP minus 3.8%. So August 29th, 2018, they projected they'd be down 3.8%, but kind of bopping back up to the front part, the top part of the screen, you can say they actually came in at minus 10.8%. Same with operating expenses, they projected they'd be down 0.3%, they actually came in above 3.5%. And then you can do the same sort of analysis on the right-hand side of the screen with operating margin, total margin, and days cash on hand. Um, in August 29th, they thought they would come in at minus 921,000. Uh, they actually came in minus seven million. There is a little asterisk here. Um, so this is a place where the board asked for more information. Um, on August 9th of 2018, Green Mountain Care Board staff asked Springfield um, whether or not their projections were still valid. And they did update their projection at that time to say that they would have a minus $2.5 million um, operating loss. Total margin. Um, August 29th, they projected it would be minus 0.4% or minus 263,000. They came in much lower than that. And days cash on hand, you can see they projected 178 days cash on hand when they actually came in um, 47 days cash on hand. Are there any questions so far on those, the top and the middle portion of the slide? Agatha, can you remind us when uh, you received the year end results? Um, we as a board received the year. Yes, results. January 31st, right, Lori? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Of this year. Of this year. Thank you. And Agatha, just to also clarify, on when when they presented on on August 29th, it was also asked at that time where they thought they were going to end up because their margin was running unfavorably. Uh, I think about two million um, at that point through April was where they were reporting, and they still said they would only be about two and a half million dollars negative. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. Thanks. 
Okay, so then the bottom part of the slide, again, we're still looking at FY18 actuals, how the year ended. This is an analysis that the staff like to provide that shows the end of one fiscal year compared to the end of the fiscal year the previous year. So how did FY17 compare to FY18? So you can see their MPR um, increased in FY18 1.9%. Their operating expenses increased by 7.6%. On the right-hand side, again, are those three financial indicators that we track. Um, one point of clarification, and you've heard us say this before, but in case there's new people in the audience, um, you'll see it says operating margin, operating margin percentage change in points. And what that means is it's the difference between FY17 and FY18 in points. So with, if you look at this, this will say that their operating margin in FY18 was minus 5.7 points lower than it was in 2017. Um, total margin percentage change in points is minus 8.8, .8, and a day's cash on hand is minus 55 days. Any questions? Um, this slide shows, we've asked Springfield to come in today and address their year-to-date performance. So this slide shows their FY19 year-to-date performance as of February 28th. Um, again, same format. We're seeing an NPR budget to actual variance of minus 5.4%. Just want to make sure I don't have any notes to myself here. Nope. Um, operating expenses are coming in above budget, 3.9% and then their financial indicators as of February 28, 2019 are minus 7.9%, which is up compared to their year-end results of FY18. I'm, uh, yeah, up. Total margin is minus 12.7%, and days cash on hand is 9.4, which is significantly lower than their um, how they finished up FY18. Um, their actual to actual comparison, so same data, just a different look. This is how they did February 28th, 2017, compared to the same date in 2018. Their NPR FPP um, grew by 1.6%. Their operating expenses grew by 5%. For their financial indicators, again, a point in time, this is as of February 28th, 2017, their operating, I'm sorry, 2018. Their operating margin was minus 4.6. Their total margin was minus 1.8. And as you know, we did not ask for a day's cash on hand um, in 2018, so we don't have that data point. And then this last section is um, when they submitted their FY19 year-to-date results, they, hospitals also submit a projection for the remainder of the fiscal year. Um, so they're projecting, Springsfield is projecting uh, that they'll be under budget 5.4% on NPR FPP, they'll be over budget on operating expenses by 1%, and they're projecting that their operating margin will, um, the difference between their budget to projection is minus 6.2 points, and on total margin, minus 9.2 points, and they're projecting that their day's cash on hand will come in 98, 98 days lower than they budgeted. So any questions on this chart? We're almost there, we have two more charts. Two more slides. All right, so this slide shows, um, the next two slides will show five years of results. We're tracking from um, FY14 actuals all the way to FY18 actuals with a little kind of intermission in between for FY2018 budget and FY2018 projection. So um, you'll see, and so the top row is the dollar figure. The bottom row is the percentage change between, from the previous year. So we've calculated the percentage change from the previous years for each full actual year, actual results. We did not calculate the percentage change for budget and projection, just because they're budget and projection. So the, the numbers below are the actual change from 14 to 15, 15 to 16, 16 to 17, and 17 to 18. And you can see that it's significantly up in 2015, and then down and up a little bit more in 2018. 
The five-year CAGR is a calculation of um, five years of actual results, so 2014 to 2018, and it comes in at 1.6%. We've also included their budget for FY19 over here. This same analysis is done for operating expenses, so you can see the dollar figures here. Um, their five-year CAGR is 2.8% for operating expenses, a growth of 2.8%, and their budget for FY19 is $60.6 million. And again, the percentage change from year to year is reflected um, on the last row. Any questions? Okay. Um, and then this yeah, last... Let's just make a oh, comment, yeah. and this will probably be more discussed when um, Springfield comes up, but... If we also added a column which puts their new forecast in, mm -hmm. which was um, 56, 744, that would be up 7.1% for the year. And when we flip to the prior page through February, they were up 1.9%, and last year they were up, I think, 1.7. So that means the back half of the, of the year has to be up double digits significantly. So. Um, I don't know if you guys had talked to Springfield about that or we can wait until they come up, but I just wanted to point that out. It's significant growth for the next seven months. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be you know, questioning that. Yeah, I think that would be a good question for Springfield to address. Yeah. <coughs> okay, and then this last slide is five-year results for operating margin, total margin. Just want to point out all the data sources that staff pulled together to put this together because um, it's, it's actually a complicated uh, graph to put together. Um, and if anybody wants to go into deeper on these, on these data points, the data sources are listed below. So for operating margin, um, it's expressed as a dollar figure and as a percentage. So this is not a percentage change. This is a percentage of operating margin. Um, again, we've included the budget for um, FY 2018 and the projection we have a little asterisk here. You've seen this asterisk before. This is, again, um, drawing attention to the, the, the query that the board made regarding their projections and whether or not they were still accurate for operating margin. Um, and again, they did update their projection to say it would be a minus $2.5 million operating margin, which ended up coming in at a, a minus $7 million at the, at the year end. And then total margin, um, it's the same same data from FY14 to FY18, including the budget for uh, 2019, expressed as a dollar value and then as a, as a percentage. So that concludes the data portion. Um, this is the data that we've asked Springfield to come in and be prepared to address. Um, so at this point, are there any questions? Any questions for the staff? Thank you very much. Great. Agatha and Lori, if we could invite Mike and Wayne to come up. Before you get started, I just want to uh, welcome you both because I believe this is your first time here before the Green Mountain Care Board. And I just want to say on behalf of all the board that um, we're very thankful for the efforts that you have put in in trying to uh, turn the situation around at Springfield. And uh, we wish you the very best in those efforts. So thank you for all that you've done to date and what you will do in the future. So whenever you're ready, you can take it away. So swear in, correct. Not sure. Not sure how well this, how close I have to be to the mic. Can Fairly close. Uh, I think that works. It's working good, though. Is we it working? It. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Chairman Mullen, thank you very much for having us here. Um, we do have a presentation that uh, I guess kind of combines both um, taking a look at where we're at in 2019 and then also taking a look at, you know, our request 
for a rate a mid-year rate increase um, so th that's the presentation that you'll see uh, many of the numbers obviously are going to be the same as the numbers that your staff has just put up um, but it hopefully will give you an opportunity to, to see a little bit of be what's behind those numbers from our perspective um, so if I can figure out how to work this there we go uh, first thing that I wanted to, to do is to uh, introduce both of us to the to the board um, and to the audience that's here. Um, again, my name is Mike Halstead. Um, I uh, am a employee of Quorum and the hospital, Springfield Hospital and uh, Springfield Medical Care uh, System has a contract with Quorum um, to provide an interim CEO which I am, and to my left is, is Wayne Schultz. Uh, he's our interim CFO. We'll talk about when we arrived, uh, but a little bit of our background just briefly, uh, if we can do that. Um, I'm a 40 plus year healthcare executive. Uh, over that 40 plus years, I've been a CFO, a CEO, um, and most recently uh, was the uh, vice president of East Division uh, for Quorum Health Resources, which essentially says that I was the corporate person responsible for the hospitals that we dealt with um, uh, and, and had arrangements with from roughly the Mississippi River east to the Atlantic Ocean and up to Maine and down to Florida. Um, and, and so I've got a, a, a lot of health care experience. Um, I was actually uh, retired when I got the call from Quorum to see if I could uh, be uh, willing to come up and, and help Springfield Hospital uh, because Quorum had just been engaged. Uh, Wayne here is is also a 40 plus year uh, healthcare executive in the financial world. Um, he, I think, was also retired uh, when he got the call. Um, so we're both pulled out of retirement uh, to come up and, and help the Springfield Hospital and, and we're very excited about being here. Um, we're here, as I said, um, as uh, employees of Quorum Health Resources. And if you're not familiar with Quorum Health Resources, that's a national healthcare company. It's been in business for over 40 years, uh, based out of uh, Brentwood, Tennessee. Um, and we work with over 100 hospitals uh, in the country, um, uh, providing uh, hospital leadership as well as operational consulting uh, for the hospitals. And much of what we've been able to do at Springfield so far has been based on uh, data uh, an analysis that the consultants from the operational side of Quorum has provided us. So um, provide, uh, Quorum provides us with the, the information that we needed to make some of the decisions that we've made. Um, here's a slide a little bit different, and I apologize, same kind of numbers, and it's a very busy slide. Um, but there's a couple of things that uh, we wanted to point out. Um, on this slide because it'll lead into some of the discussions on future slides. Um, obviously, the, the first thing is is that the net income, uh, which if I can figure out how to use this laser pointer, here we go, uh, net income right here, um, you can see uh, what's happening with that net income and then the, the final, the net gain. Uh, those are very similar numbers, uh, if not the exact numbers that your staff just presented you in terms of where the organization has been um, and you'll see in a second um, our analysis of why we're in the situation that we're in. We believe that the prior projections of the revenue and expenses for the years 2018 and 2019 budget were significantly overly optimistic. And, and you'll see from a point of view on the, on the revenue side, if you look at admi uh, activity levels, um, which is what drives your revenue. Um, when we arrived on the scene, we saw that the 2019 budget that w had been presented was actually, and that, and that should be, that's an error right there. Um, instead of being 128%, it should be 28% greater than what the 2017 actual was. So the budget is basically saying that, you know, 28% higher than, than the most recent actual information that was available. Um, if you looked at the 2019 year-to-date February, uh, that's 35% higher, uh, or I'm sorry, less than the 2019 budget. And so again, the acute admissions, um, which drives the inpatient part of the business, um, is 
not coming in where the 2019 budget had estimated it, it should be. And on the 2019 projected, it's 33% less than what the 2018 actual was. Um, so activity levels is a problem. If you look at the outpatient side of the business, uh, the emergency room visits mean 6% less than the budget uh, and 8% less than last fiscal year. Uh, that's 2019 to 2018. Same thing occurring in the other major driver for revenue, the operating room cases are 29% less than the budget for 2019 and 8% less than the 2018 uh, amounts. Again, if you look at it over a three-year period, which we did, um, the expenses are increasing at the rate of 11% uh, uh, when the revenues have increased only less than 1%. So it's not difficult to see then what's happening with the operating losses going from basically a break-even in the year 2016 uh, to the $6 million, uh, 6.9, almost $7 million actual number for 2018. And what we're projecting right now, uh, without any further increase uh, in 2019, that we're going to come in around a $6 million loss uh, from operations. When the board finally realized uh, what was going on, they immediately um, asked for a audit to be done, not only the financial audit to be done, but also a forensic audit. Um, the, the main purpose of that was to find out, uh, was there any uh, misappropriation of funds? Uh, was was the, their funds going outside the organization to create those kinds of losses? Um, the audit that was done by uh, Barry Dunn, it was a forensic audit, um, concluded after they had looked at it for several months uh, that there was no misappropriation of funds, uh, but that there was uh, a greater need for transparency of information throughout the whole organization, starting from the governor governance level all the way through the management level, uh, and that uh, there were some financial policies uh, that weren't followed, uh, specifically uh, policies around the use of investment monies. Um, the investment monies were uh, drawn down from the investments, as you can see the cash on hand going down, um, without the uh, knowledge to some degree of the governance uh, of the organization. Um, and so that's what uh, the audit encouraged uh, the organization to do. Uh, we have, have addressed those issues in a couple of different ways. Uh, we're, we've improved the kind of reporting that goes to the board on a monthly basis. Uh, we're using the, a lot of the templates that Quorum uses, um, and we're asking for approvals from the board that they hadn't been asked for before uh, relative to capital acquisitions and so forth, um, as well as we're um, improving the communication with the employees, with the management teams. Um, we're trying to improve the uh, communication with the community, um, and uh, as, as well as hopefully um, your organization here uh, is feeling a little bit better about the information that we're trying to get to you on a more timely basis. Um, I hope you can appreciate that um, when we came on the scene, uh, it was difficult to understand the very complex organization that Springfield Hospital, along with Springfield uh, Medical Care Systems, uh, has, uh, and for us to get our arms around that very quickly and understand and be able to provide the information that, that we could rely as being uh, as accurate as we possibly could be. Now, some of the drivers to those expenses, as you can see, it's, it's, not, um, it, it's not the revenue side of the story, except that we're not reaching the levels that we should be. Uh, it's the expenses that uh, uh, are, have been, uh, uh, if I can use the term, a little out of control. Um, and so when you look at those expenses, we, we took a look at it over the last three years just to, to get an idea of what the drivers were, the major drivers. And it's three, three major categories. Uh, in the employee benefit side, primarily health insurance over that three-year period, and that has gone up 2.5%. Um, I'm sorry, 2.5%, 2.5 million dollars, which is about 69% uh, from the year 2015 to the year 2018. Um, that's a significant increase uh, in cost. Um, the organization has a 
self-insured health care program, um, which we're looking at changing as soon as we can um, to see if we have a, a more uh, cost-effective and efficient way to provide that health insurance. Um, in the purchase service area, which is also a $2.5 million increase, or about 27% over that three-year period, um, half of that increase is driven by locums. Uh, locums being um, providers of care that um, are on a, a temporary basis. Um, anytime we have a vacancy in the organization uh, and we're not able to fill that provider with a, with a full-time person, we've got to bring in a locum on a part-time basis. Um, about $1.4 million increase over that three-year period uh, was in those areas. Um, and then in the uh, purchase service area, the emergency room provider, uh, we had some changes over there, and that the increase in expenses were about 745000 uh, in just that ED line. And you'll see how we've addressed that. Um, and then in physician fees, uh, we have brought on a, a, a second orthopedic surgeon. Um, and uh, over that three-year period, um, the, the cost, which occurred primarily in the in the year 2018, um, drove uh, that increase in cost or increase in expense. Um, I may be advancing too fast here because uh, no, I guess I'm okay. Um, one of the questions that uh, the staff at the Green Mountain Care Board had um, was they wanted to see the transfer of funds uh, between the organizations. So we tried to put this slide together. Uh, it, it, it's a very confusing slide. It takes a lot of explanation. I'm going to take a, a stab at it. Um, this shows the actual cash that, that flowed from the hospital over to uh, Springfield Medical Care Systems. Um, now, Springfield Medical Care Systems is the parent organization uh, of Springfield Hospital. Um, it houses both the, an FQHC uh, as well as a lot of the senior management team uh, and other management uh, services that are provided to both organizations. Um, so for example, in the year 2019 through March 31st, you see a figure of $1.6 million of cash going from the hospital's uh, accounts over to the uh, parent organization. A lot of that was to pay for some back expenses of the parent organization, which could be both FQHC and the um, uh, shared management team uh, that is housed in Springfield Medical Care uh, Systems Corporation. Um, we don't anticipate having any more of that uh, going for the rest of this year. Uh, we believe that the cash flow uh, for that parent organization will be sufficient enough to, to pay its own expenses um, and not have to send any cash from the hospital over. While you're on that slide, and I was trying to save it towards the end, but since you have that slide up. Sure. Um, in the finance committee notes that you had um, ending March of this year, on the uh, net transferred in and out you had 4.671 million how does that jive with what we're seeing on this slide you, yeah that's why Wayne's here <laughs> <laughs> okay well we're really talking about two different things here this is actual cash that was transferred and the number you're reading on that financial write-up indicates uh, costs that are allocated between the organizations and so that's a much larger number than the actual cash so you know as an example the hospital could be paying for expenses um, for both organizations and then there's just an accounting allocation so that hits that line item that you're reading right there um, so it's just it's just a much larger number that the cash that we send over because we keep separate bank accounts between the two different entities and so, I mean, since I arrived, cash has been very tight, as you can imagine. So we actually project cash by the week going forward. 
And so I can tell you two weeks from now or three weeks from now or four weeks from now, we got to transfer funds. And funds can go both ways. But in the historical perspective, the funds have always been flowing towards SMCS out of the hospital. Hospital gathers a lot more cash than does the, the clinics, as an example. It's just a much bigger financial operation. So that's the basic answer. I know it gets more complex than that. If you really broke into that number, there'd be a lot of line items that make it up. But that, that's my perspective when I looked at it. Hope that answers your question. Well, I think it does. I think what I heard you say is that you're accruing in your financial system the 4.67 million. And these numbers here only reflect the actual cash. Yes, sir. I think that's correct. I mean, I call it an allocation versus an accrual. Uh, obviously, there could be some expenses that are accrued on a monthly basis, but it's the actual allocation of expense over from one entity to the other. Yeah. Um, well, you know, well, accounting well, treatment-wise, I mean, this is my opinion because this is not the way it's set up currently in the system, but in my experience, accounting-wise, you would have like a due-to and due-from between two organizations. And then when you produce the consolidated financials, they just wipe each other out because it's all part of the same organization. So if you were to look at the consolidated audit report, you would see that kind of entries made as well. But this is the way it's been expressed on the on an interim basis in our financials. So, so what would be the uh, purpose of the transfers to SMCS? Is there a portion of any administrative um, expenses such as your salaries that are paid for by SMCS versus Springfield Hospital or I'm just trying to get to you know what the the logic is behind yeah. it. well in general you're correct they go both ways and I say that because there could be some expenses that the hospital pays uh, the, the biggest expense that, that probably pertains to this question would be uh, employee health claims because the hospitals pays a hundred percent so a lot of that cost has to be filtered over to the clinic side. So that's when you see the big dollars. That's the biggest expense. And then on the SMCS side, uh, as an example, my salary might reside in that. And we allocate around 25 to 40% of costs back over to the other organization. So there's a, it goes both ways. I mean, you have to dissect the number to really find out the total dollars going back and forth for the allocation of cost. That's the best way I can explain it. Okay. Sure, Tom. So off the same document that Kevin referenced, um, the budget amount for um, that netting was 225000 versus the $4.7 million. You know, that shows there. And I can understand that there would be flow of funds coming the other way to offset some of that. But do you think that by the end of the year, um, that that $220,000 uh, budgeted amount, um, which I would assume would have all these ins and outs reconciled, um, is on target? No, sir. <laughs> I do not believe that. And the reason I know that is because I know a big, a big portion of those dollars related to some liabilities that had to be paid that we were behind in. And that's probably part of what clouded the issue last summer when the hospital presented to this board, because I'm not sure anybody asked those questions about the current liabilities. The liabilities have been growing. Uh, but even after that, I guess the meeting was in August. Is that when? So I think um, September, October, November were the main months that the liabilities are really grew. So if you were to go back and look at the details of our financials in this current fiscal year, you would see at the end of December, we made some large payments to pay down current liabilities. At the end of January, we made almost an equally large amount of payments. So there were some huge liabilities sitting out there that were required to be paid on those dates. And so we actually, that's where a lot of the cash went. So when the cash was liquidated out of our investment accounts, we, we reduced those liabilities. So those dollars are locked in. They're not coming back. That's so you, you talked to, uh, about that uh, big uh, change last fall, and um, I know that you both know what you signed, but uh, the attestation of oath does have paragraph six, which is the same attestation that your predecessor signed. 
and they failed to neglect to update us. So I'm just bringing that out to make sure that you both understand that if there is all of a sudden a major change, that you would notify us. Okay, I, you know, I understand you. I understand what you're saying. Um, I mean, I, I, this is my commentary. Okay, I'm not quoting facts, but because I wasn't here back then, but. Yeah. The financial statements that were produced at that time, I'm guessing, showed this increase in liabilities. So the CFO and the CEO could have been absolutely truthful. Here are the financials. And if somebody doesn't ask the question, why are liabilities growing so much? Because uh, some of those, some of these liabilities that, that we had to pay down in, in uh, December were accruing last summer. So they could have been paid then. They had the capability of paying them. They just did not. And so, I mean, this board could have asked that question. I, you know, I, don't, I didn't go back to look to see what you saw. Yeah, so I assume it was correct, but I don't the, know the that. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that it's not incumbent upon this board to ask the question. If there's a material change, it's incumbent upon you to notify us of that. And okay. I would say, for example, um, finding out four months after uh, payments were shut off from CMS, that's something that we should have been notified about because then we could have asked questions of CMS on, on Springfield's behalf as well and tried to do something. So that's the only point I'm trying to bring oh, I to see. you I see. is that you signed an oath that says you will notify us of significant changes. So if anything truly significant occurs, I would hope that you would bring those to us, unlike what we saw in the past. Oh, I see. That's the point I'm trying to make. I understand. And, and, and that's, and Chair, Mr. Chairman, that's precisely why that earlier slide said that we're trying to be more transparent with, with the community, with the board, with your organization. That's our intent, to be as transparent as we possibly can be. When we know about it, we're going to communicate it. Thank you. Uh, moving on, and so up to this point, we've kind of talked about history. Um, the rest of this presentation is going to talk about what we've been trying to do and changing the future outcome of the organization. And, and to, um, if I may say it in this terms, save this organization, because um, it is on the verge of um, not being able to continue as a, a going concern. Um, back uh, at the tail end of 2018, um, the, the board made the decision to change CEO and CFO almost at the same time. Um, that's when Quorum Health Resources uh, was asked to assume the leadership. Uh, Wayne came on board shortly before January. I came on board January 17th, um, and we've been very focused on um, how do we change that cost curve. Um, at some point in the very near future, we're going to shift our gears and start looking more at how do we um, get those activity levels up that I talked about earlier. But initially, we had to look at the cost curve. Um, fortunately, this, the state stepped up and was able to provide us with about a million dollars uh, of advanced um, Medicaid money. Uh, that helped us get through a couple of pay periods right at the end of January, early February, that we would have had trouble getting through uh, without the assistance uh, of the state to do that. So where have we focused our energies? This particular slide attempts to show you on a hospital point of view um, what are some of the key initiatives that we have um, enacted. And, and it identifies a, an, an annualized amount of money that we think uh, we can save the organization and as well as what uh, we should be able to recognize between now and September 30th or over the next five months or so. Um, we had a reduction in force. Um, we, we targeted or tried to target um, the non-patient care areas, um, the non-patient care areas. Um, and, and that is going to, we believe, um, reduce the expenses of the organization about $1.7 million. Um, since that time that we had that reduction in force, 
uh, we've had turnover. And I have a slide in a few minutes that shows you where that turnover has occurred. Um, but we've had um, uh, voluntary folks leave. Um, and I can understand why. Uh, there's a, a great uncertainty about the organization. Um, and so in today's day and age, um, there's a lot of healthcare organizations that are recruiting very heavily for healthcare professionals. And, and so uh, we're doing everything we possibly can to try to maintain the staff that we have um, in, in terms of communication, in terms of recognition, but we, we had turnover. Um, that's gonna produce uh, unfortunately, uh, about $442,000 of less expense, um, and that's uh, the people that we believe we will not have to replace. Um, there have been a greater number of staff that have left that we're going to have to replace because they're in key positions that we can't operate the facility without. Uh, we've had some uh, efforts in employee benefit reductions. In, in some very minor areas, um, but it'll produce uh, about 78,000 in savings, we think. Um, we've restructured their, the organization employees' paid time off accrual limits, uh, lowered them. Um, they were a little higher uh, than uh, some of our competi competing hospitals, so we brought those in line. Um, we changed the emergency department provider contractor. Um, we have a new contractor now, and we think that's going to save us about $948,000 a year. Um, we had to make the very tough decision uh, several weeks ago um, to discontinue childbirth. Um, our childbirth uh, unit uh, on a contribution to margin um, was costing us about just under $700,000 a year. Um, we looked at it from a, a, a community perspective. Um, there are fewer and fewer women delivering babies going on in the future, that's being predicted. Um, so we found it very difficult to be able to grow that business. And without growing it, um, we couldn't sustain a $695,000 negative contribution. So we've, uh, the board made the very difficult decision to uh, wind that program down. Um, right now, it looks like we will no longer be delivering babies after May 3rd. Um, We've uh, uh, revamped the staffing in our hospitalist program um, in terms of the, the kind of personnel that we have staffing that hospitalist program, and so that should save us 270,000. Um, we're looking at uh, changing the surgical services. Uh, there's probably more savings to be achieved there, but right now we know of 225,000. Uh, a lot of that is a result of the fact that we do, will not have the childbirth unit, so we don't have to have as much anesthesia coverage um, as, as we would have had to have uh, with a child birthing unit. Um, and then we're going to be eliminating uh, for some temporary period of time, hopefully, the, the match on the employee's 401k retirement program. Um, so all of that, we believe, will reduce our expenses by about $4.7 million. Um, the other part of the organization um, that uh, we thought might be helpful for you to see is there's an additional savings over at the SMCS, uh, Springfield Medical Care Systems, uh, which we've talked about before, housing the FQHC and uh, some of the senior uh, leadership uh, management of the entire organization. Similar type uh, reductions uh, in that part of the organization, which will produce, we believe, about $2.8 million on an annual basis. Um, you add those two numbers together, we're over $7 million in savings um, between the two organizations. Um, so uh, that's a significant amount of, of money uh, to remove from the organization in a short period of time. Uh, questions at this point on any of that? I know I'm going quickly. Um, we, we'll hold them until I get okay. finished. This particular slide, uh, I talked about the turnover. I, I, I just wanted to give you some uh, view on the kind of personnel that uh, that has left the organization since February 1st, uh, or 2nd, I guess, as the slide says. Um, about 77 people have left the organization. That's on a base system-wide of about 550 people. Um, 
and you can see that uh, about 65 percent of that I would call in the direct patient care uh, areas um, and the remaining 30 something percent is management and administrative areas uh, those are primarily the areas that we're going to try to operate the organization without replacing um, the other areas uh, uh, some 50 some FDEs were actively recruiting to try to replace those people We've got some other significant uh, activities going on uh, from a strategic point of view. Um, we continue almost on a weekly basis to be talking with the bank uh, for the long-term debt issues. Um, much of what we just went through, the uh, four point something million dollars on the hospital reductions and the $2.7 million on the uh, FQHC side of the business um, deals with being able to go forward and be able to balance our inflows of revenue with our outflows of expenses. Uh, we still have debt that we have to deal with. So we have to strategically uh, look at that. Uh, so we're continuing to negotiate with the bank. Uh, we're uh, trying the best we can to negotiate with our accounts payable vendors. Uh, we have about $7.4 million uh, of accounts payable vendors that, that still um, we owe money to. Um, we're looking at what are some of the legal options that we can take strategically to deal with that. And we're also um, talking with other organizations uh, about partnering with them in some fashion. Um, and uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock is, is where we're having some preliminary discussions at this point. So today, um, Hopefully, what, if I got the message across to you, you've heard is, is that um, we're attempting to, to uh, put the organization going forward uh, in a position where it can um, meet its ongoing operating uh, commitments. Um, we're, we're, uh, we've really attacked the expense side of the business. We're trying to manage the business the best we can. Um, we're going to be shifting our efforts to how do we uh, begin to generate uh, more activity at the hospital. Very difficult to do today with all of the publicity that we're getting about the future of the organization, but we're, we're dealing with that. Um, and what we're asking you today is to help us a little bit uh, by granting us the 5% uh, increase um, in our rates so that we can generate a little bit more revenue uh, to buy us some more time uh, to make some of these adjustments that we uh, are planning on making. At this point, I'm concluded, and I don't know when you want to go to the question part of the presentation. Thank you, Mike. And as you know, we have to divide it up into two different uh, hearings, one on the uh, enforcement and one on the uh, request for a charge change. So. Um, Unfortunately, though, all the questions will probably relate to both, which may make the, the second hearing quite short. But um, I just want to uh, start out by asking a few questions that were sent to me by Dr. Holmes. Um, she sends her regrets for not being here today. Um, she had scheduled something in anticipation of this hearing happening uh, previously, and with the reschedule, it just uh, things didn't work. But. She's a hardworking, dedicated member of uh, the board. Um, one of her questions is that um, asking you what you attribute the substantial drop in the year-to-date 2019 utilization, 25% drop in acute care admissions, 30% drop in OR cases, sizable reductions in imaging, et cetera, and has the percentage drop in utilization been equal across all three payers? That, that's, those are great questions, uh, and I wish I had a really solid answer for you. Um, we're trying to analyze that right now. It's probably a combination, I, I would think, of at least two things. Uh, one is um, the, the fact that we are getting a lot of negative press, if I can put it that way, 
Um, so we know people are probably concerned uh, about seeking their health care from us and maybe going elsewhere. Um, the other issue might be that, and this would be, I guess, a positive thing from an overall health standpoint, is uh, some of the efforts that we have in population health and the uh, accountable care organizations uh, may be taking, having some effect in terms of people seeking less uh, of their utilization. Um, we do know we've been monitoring, and this is just current, we've been monitoring the change in the emergency room in terms of the providers um, and what we're noticing at least, it, but it's only been since April 9th now, um, but their style of um, providing care in the emergency room uh, shows that, that they're ordering fewer uh, radiological tests, they're ordering fewer lab tests uh, than our previous provider was ordering. So we're expecting that we're going to see a decline in those two major ancillaries um, because just the way they practice medicine uh, different than the previous providers did. Um, so that's the best answers. I don't know, Wayne, if you have anything to add to that, but we really don't, Mr. Chairman, we don't, we don't have I got to stand in front of you today and say we don't have a good answer for why those volumes are declining. We haven't been able to really analyze them that well yet. So with that being said, with the lower utilization, the natural follow-up is why are physician fees running over budget? Uh, probably the, the physician fees um, are, are, are those in the hospital or uh, they must be in the hospital. I'm not sure. I don't know the number that you're referring to. Is it expenses? Yeah. Oh, well, it, 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 the expense side, I thought you were talking about the revenues, I'm sorry. Um, on the expense side, it, it would be primarily what I had indicated earlier that um, we were either bringing in locums to, to fill in for people that we've lost, or we've gone out to recruit additional physicians to try to beef up the revenue side of the business. Okay. So that flows nicely into our next question, which is talking about uh, retention. And I know that you and, about, you and I have had some conversations about this. Um, can you just talk about how you plan on keeping enough people there? We're, we're, we're going to lock the doors and keep them there. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. I, um, well, what we're trying to do, we, we back on February 24th, uh, we uh, told the, the staff that starting on February 20th, well, we told them early February, but we told them that as of February 24th, um, the entire organization was going to take a wage uh, reduction. Um, and if they were part of management, they would take a 10%. If they were part of non-management, they'd take a 4%. Um, we believe because of the reductions that we just showed you, um, that we're in a position now um, to restore those wages. Um, we're hoping that by restoring those wages, and that's going to be effective May 5th, um, that people who were considering leaving because they just couldn't absorb those kinds of reductions in their paychecks every two weeks uh, would change their mind and stay with us. Um, so we're trying to address it from a dollars and cents point of view. Uh, we're also trying to address it from a recognition point of view. Um, we, we uh, on April 11th, held a service awards dinner. Um, we did it on the cheap because we don't have a lot of money to spend to do that. But we thought it was important enough to recognize um, that the years of service that our employees have given us. And, and I was so impressed that that night, we had 955 years of service being recognized. People who had, uh, were celebrating 5, 10, 15, 20. We had one employee celebrate 50 years of service with us, um, and she's still with us. Um, so we're trying to do both monetarily by reinstating the, the salaries, as well as non-monetarily uh, by way of recognition and uh, encouraging people to stay. It, it's, uh, it's not an easy task because of uh, you know, what we're facing. We're trying to be very transparent uh, with our staff and we're keeping them apprised of where we're at financially, so. So with the transparency with the staff, are you conducting town hall meetings? 
with the staff we are. We're holding um, uh, what we call our employee sessions. Uh, I hold them around the clock, um, as well as we we're, we go out to the various clinics uh, that are part of the FQHC. Um, so yes, we're holding those. And matter of fact, I have two more set up for May 7th and 9th, I think it is. But we're trying to hold those about every three weeks. And is the community being engaged so that the staff and the community can be part of the solution moving forward? Uh, great point, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we had several uh, of the uh, community leaders come in and, and uh, have a session with me and with Josh Dufresne uh, just a week or 10 days ago. Um, and we're planning uh, to hold, a, in later May, to hold a, a town hall meeting with the community and bring the community up to date. We're, we're trying our best to, to do that as we can through communication um, you know, with the newspaper primarily and on our website. Okay. Another question that Dr. Holmes had, um, if you take a look at um, the non-operating uh, income that was shown on slide three and then compare it to, um, to the statement of operations in the uh, finance committee minutes, um, it looks like the non-operations income had been going up between 2016 and 2018, but now appears to be heading in the opposite direction, a $1.7 million swing um, from the 2019 budget. What would explain that? I can answer that question. So at the end of September, well, actually, when I arrived in mid-December, the hospital had about $12 million in investments which was generating the non-operating income for the most part. You know, there were some contributions in there, but the bulk of it was related to investment income. So as I had mentioned earlier, we had to pay down some current liabilities very quickly in December. So we liquidated uh, a large portion of those investments. Well, if you remember what the stock market was doing in December, that was a bad time to liquidate. Uh, that was at the bottom of the market, and of course we're required accounting-wise to to state what the market values are, like at the end of December, and then we liquidated literally the end of December. So we liquidated at the low end of the market, so we basically locked in those losses off the investments. And so that's the big number that's in the, showing up right now is a big negative. It'll be there the rest of this year. Um, Has there been any reduction in uh, community support? I'm not aware of any major reductions. Community support from a donation point of view? Yeah, I'm assuming that uh, like any nonprofit institution that um, yeah. there are fundraisers. I know years ago there used to be a cotillion down there. I don't know if they still do that. But. Uh, uh, no, they're, 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 we really haven't had much activity in that area. There's just a lot of uncertainty about the organization and the future of the organization that, that people aren't really willing to contribute right now. So we haven't seen a lot of donations coming in as typically we'd see. Which is unfortunate. You'd like to see the, the community get invested in the uh, turnaround. Um, Mike, when, when I went down and met with you in Springfield, you, you expressed some frustration about um, the systems that were in place to give you adequate information so you could make the right decisions. Do you feel like, um, I could say, did Wayne change that so that you now have better information so that you're you're confident now in the decisions that you're making being the right ones i'm definitely more confident um than i was when i met with you then uh, wayne has done a phenomenal job in making sure that the accounting systems are giving accurate information and we're making all the proper accruals and so forth that we should be making um, the concern I continue to have is uh, in the IT area, um, our uh, information technology systems, uh, the organization apparently was considering uh, making a change uh, shortly before all of this kind of fell apart. Um, and, and, and so there wasn't a lot of investment put into the IT system thinking that they were going to be changing to a new one. Uh, we don't have the wherewithal to change to a new one. So we've got a, an IT system that is kind of patched together. Um, 
and and so there's I still have a lot of concern about how well the IT system works, but I'm a whole lot more confident that the numbers that we're getting from the IT system are accurate. Okay. Um, one of the questions that uh, I had that, uh, and I know Maureen and I were trying to figure this out uh, a year ago, but um, when Tim and Scott and Josh were here last August, they talked about um, the huge hit to the, the employee self-insurance. And um, in, we sh then looked at your 2017 audit, and it made reference to having reinsurance to um, have a, a stop loss. And then um, Tim and Scott had made reference to joining NIA, which would give them access to reinsurance. And then today, again, you talked about um, the employee benefit side um, coming in over what had been budgeted. Where do you stand with reinsurance for? Um, basically, uh, there was a period of time towards the end of 18 um, that because we weren't timely on paying our basic insurance premiums uh, and claims, not premiums, but claims, um, that the reinsurance company was refusing to, to honor the contract that we had with them. Um, we've been able to get that straightened out, so we did get some reinsurance monies come in just recently uh, on claims that pertain to the 2018 year. Um, we're still having high utilization of our health insurance plan by our own employees. So. We also had uh, uh, several, I'm, I'm trying not to disclose names of, of any sort because I don't know the names, but we had some employee health claims that were called lasered, meaning they were not going to cover these as outliers and they were large outliers that I don't know how, I don't know the details of how they knew in advance on our policy, but when those large claims came in, those were paid directly out of pocket. So we didn't have any reinsurance to cover those large claims. So that's part of why the high costs continued again this year. So your reinsurance doesn't cover those outliers? No, sir. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, as you can imagine, and I think I forwarded uh, one or two of the uh, public comments that we've received over the last few months, um, we have been hearing from the public on different things. and. Um, one of the uh, more recent uh, messages that we received was trying to get answers on um, the emergency department. And um, it appeared that uh, it was very logical for you to save money by switching to uh, Blue Water. Um, but this email seems to assert that there are now additional charges that Blue Water is going to be able to um, incur that may end up making it not a saving. So I thought maybe you could address that in a public forum because they're saying that um, you're authorizing Blue Water to do um, split fee or facility uh, billing that they will be directly billing for and receiving the payments, not going to Springfield Hospital, so that those charges are um, not being counted in the equation? Well, let me tell you, there, there is a change in the way uh, the billing occurs. The, the previous uh, provider of emergency services that we contracted with, uh, we did a combined bill. We would bill for both the hospital piece and the physician or professional piece. Um, the new contract with Blue Water uh, allows us to only bill for the hospital piece, and Blue Water will bill for the professional component. Um, now, we, we have the ability to comment on whatever charges they're setting, but they do their own billing, um, and, and they do their own collection. Uh, and they will follow our charity policy, so if we determine a patient the, who comes in and qualifies for charity care according to our policy, Blue Water will honor that. 
and will not, you know, charge that patient either. So I, I, I don't know why the person feels like, you know, there's going to be additional fees. They, it should be just a, a split between a getting a bill from us, which will be significantly lower uh, because it doesn't have the physician component on it, and then a bill from Blue Water as the professional provider. Well, I think they also referenced that there had been a press article that um, someone at Blue Water had said that they would be able to come back and do additional billing to you as well. Is that the case? Um, there, there, there is uh, the ability in the contract um, for them to take a look at how much they anticipated and we agreed to them generating in revenue and if the for some reason the because they're billing uh, themselves if if they don't generate a certain amount of revenue there's going to be standby costs that you have in an emergency room for having physicians there uh, if they can't build the revenue then yeah we're going to have to share in some of that shortfall that they come up with but that's pretty typical kind of an agreement with any hospital that has this kind of an arrangement. So there is some risk? There is some risk, but yeah, we, we think the numbers that we're projecting and using for the, our emergency room, we have a very busy emergency room. Um, I was pretty surprised when I came here to, for a critical hospital that size. Uh, we're doing about 15, 16,000 ER visits a year. So it's a pretty busy ER. You had done two different slides on the expense reduction and on the FQHC slide, um, which we do not have uh, regulatory authority over, but can you tell us if that creates a positive margin, those reductions? Um, we're in the process of, of uh, pulling together the 2020 budget right now. Um, we're a little shy of, with those reductions, we're a little shy in um, the rest of 2019 of being a break even. Uh, we believe we should be able to get the FQHC to a break even in the year 2020. So you believe you're on the path to? Yes. Okay, great. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maureen next and we'll just work our way down the line. Uh, sure. Um, if you could put the PL slide back up again. Um, and just, and I know you guys inherited this, so I you know, appreciate you coming in and talking to us about you know, where things stand. But a couple questions on when we look at the 2019 projection and focusing on operating expenses, the 61.3 million projection that you have is only slightly below the 2018 audited numbers. And I'm assuming, does that include the a little over $2 million that you're saving this year on your cost-saving initiatives? Let me address that. Uh, to be honest with you, when I put in the projected numbers for 2019, it's based on the monthly report where I produce what our financial results were for each month. I think that's probably came from the February file. I don't know that you got March in time for this meeting, but... When I got to the projected column, um, I mean, this is very high-level information uh, at this point in the file itself. There's not a lot of detail, and and I'm not, I haven't, I don't have a system in place for projecting through the end of the year. So I tried to sort of eyeball how much the savings would be based on the improvements that we're doing, and, and at the end of February, which was the month I was working on, we were still working on the plan of what the reductions were being. So. I, it was a pretty raw estimate that I was using, so I did try to fold in the savings as best I could at that point in time. Uh, as the months go by, hopefully I can refine that better. But with that caveat, I, you know, there are some savings in there, and I have to go back. I actually took notes on my file that I sent in. I don't know if you noticed them in the margin, but I tried to explain why I did what I did. Uh, that's the best answer I have on the projected numbers. Because okay. it seems like it may even go a little bit um, higher in expenses because you're giving back some of the salary changes, right? And you said that might be about 400000 Yes, ma'am. That that would probably be accurate because the time I did February, we, we didn't even know. We weren't even talking about the salary changes giving back at that time. Okay. Because I guess, uh, first, I, you know, I just want to back up a little bit to, to what 
you know, we've received, um, you know, from the board because for the past several years, um, this hospital has fallen far short in the top line and then have not been able to correct the expense accounts and have created a loss. So in 2017, the budget for NPR was 59 million and they came in at 52 million. In 2018, the budget was 59 million, came in at 53 million. And I know personally, I really challenged the submission at that time and the fact that expenses need to be right sized to where the revenue line is going to be and that it can't, we can't look at optimistic ex forecasts as you guys brought up as well. In 2019, again, the for forecast was 59 million, and at that time, the hospital was showing a small loss for 2018 and a slight reduction in where they said the top line was going to be. And so that puts us in a really challenging position if the information that we're given um, has not been updated. And Wayne, you actually referred to, well, if we had seen the liabilities, maybe we would have seen some of this. And I, I challenge that because what we were presented was a completely different forecast with a much higher top line, a very small loss. And we continued to challenge, is this realistic? Um, they brought up the orthopedic and that that's how they were gonna get there. And you know, there has to be some trust between the parties, but it is quite challenging when, when we don't see that. So my question now, to you guys on 2019 and where we're going with the cost savings, it still doesn't seem to be enough. And I know you're still projecting and you're looking for $6 million potentially, or you have on your list here, I think four that will be for the hospital. Um, and if I'm reading correctly for 2019, you were getting about two million in savings and you're either losing it all back to inflation or other cost changes that are going in there because your costs are gonna be about flat with 2018. And I, I fully understand in 2018, yeah. there were a lot of things that got trued up. So the healthcare expenses got trued up and so now we should be working from that base and you know we're staying about flat and so you know, the concern is, have we gone deep enough, even with the cuts of people? I mean, it's tough to do that, but you don't want to continually have to keep going back to the well and, and right. making cuts there, because that's not good for morale. And where are we going to be in 2020 with the cuts that you're projecting? Because running another, you know, now a $7 million loss with the other issues you have with selling off the, with the $12 million in, um, uh, assets that were sold off, and I understand that. You know, where is this going? So, you know, I I think there's more information that you could provide us on an updated cash flow forecast, an updated balance sheet, because, you know, where you have said we could see things on the balance sheet, we're not seeing a new balance sheet. So I think we do want to see an updated balance sheet, an updated cash flow, and a pro forma projection for where 2020 is going to be, and are the cost savings going to be enough to get us there. I mean, it's, 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 it's challenging, it's unfortunate, it's just the top line has continued to go down from, from if we actually look back even to 15, 15 was at 55 million, then 16 went to 53, then 17 went to 52, but the organization didn't shift for seeing that change and things going down and expenses kept going up. So I know you guys are looking at it, it's just we have been challenging this hospital for the past two years to really get the expenses in line with where the revenue is going to be and to put realistic forecasts up there. And um, this forecast is even $2 million lower than what the staff presented, which showed the 56 million, which I said, you know, how are you going to get there when you're only trending 2% ahead so far? And, and this would correlate with about that. But I just challenge whether you'll even be at 54 million and then you have a, an expense base. So really focusing on the expenses, how much do you think we can get and when will we see that and when would we see a break even, you know, in the hospital? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I hear, 
I, I definitely hear what you're saying, and, and we're working every day with it. Um, do I believe there are additional areas that we can find cost to a great magnitude on an individual item? No. I think we've looked at just about everything we can look at. We're looking at uh, tweaking here and there, a couple hundred thousand here and there, in a, a number of different places. <clears throat> we've, um, we have done projections. Um, and uh, those projections run from May of 2019 to April of 2020. Um, they do not indicate that we're going to have a P&L positive yet, but we will have a positive EBITDA, a little under a million dollars. Um, so it gets back to my comment earlier that we think we can get the organization to being cash neutral or a little positive on a cash flow basis. It doesn't deal with our debt, um, either past debt or going forward debt. And that continues to be an issue that we're, we're working on. And that's what my slide about strategic uh, was intended to talk about is how are we going to deal with the debt? Um, so. If we're successful, uh, I know I'm rambling a little bit, if we're successful, I think we can get the organization to a positive EBITDA number. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to get the organization to a positive P&L number in the next uh, 12 months. No, and if we, you know, if, it got, if you got the positive, you know, EBITDA numbers, you know, that that's going to be important to get there. I just challenge whether the savings that you have on the table are going to be enough to get there. And I understand what you're saying. You've taken the big lines and you think it's only small dollars from here, but it seems like you need another couple million dollars on that list to get there to fight inflationary issues that you have as well, um, because it looks like you were offset basically your whole save this year with additional expenses. So I'm not sure even if you pro form and said you're going to get another couple million Law, a couple million in savings that's going to get offset by additional expenses and you still could be showing a three or four million dollar loss next year mm -hmm. well the the, the, the I, I hate to be dramatic but if we do show a three million dollar loss we won't be here next year because sure. we don't have we don't have the reserves to cover a three million dollar loss by ourselves no and so it's it's the challenge of can you go? How can you go deeper in order to get there? Because I'm, I'm, it just seems there's still optimism in possibly both the top line and where the future is going to go. And are you offsetting inflation costs? Because it's great to see a cost savings of five million, but then where are the off offsets? You have cost increases too that are rolling through there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know these are all things you're focusing on. I'm just, you know, just saying, you know, it's it's a real challenge. But if we don't go deep enough, then it potentially could be another loss of two or three million dollars, which would be unsustainable. And so mm -hmm. it, it's that tough dilemma of how do we make a change? Because we're probably not going to get it on the revenue side. I mean, you know, we're, we're doing, even if assuming we approve the 5% in um, insurance increase, that's about half a million dollars. And you know, with what's going on, as you've been saying, are the community members all coming there? I mean, that's tough, too, because people need to come so you can get the revenue in the door. But if those things are are unpredictable, but it's probably going against you so that mm -hmm. your revenue may be coming down that way. And, you know, at some point, the expenses have to be equal to the revenue or, you know, we're right. not going to make it. So right. I, I appreciate the path that you guys are going to get there. I don't think you're there yet. And... And, you know, so what are the other options? Because we, we don't certainly want to be sitting here in another six months or a year. We couldn't do it. We're losing another three million and it's not sustainable. So I, I think, again, back back to my slide on the, you know, the strategy, you know, that we're, we're working at. I, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, we we we're, we are not going to be able to. Um, we're not going to be able to do this alone. Um, we're not going to be able to cut ourselves to sustainability um, if we can't find ways to generate additional revenue. 
Uh, I, I'm not sure how much more of big dollar expenses we're going to be able to take out. <clears throat> so that's where partnering with somebody who might be able to share some of that cost um, and, and make the organization sustainable by being a part of a larger system is part of the strategy that we've got going forward. We just need to be able to buy enough time to do that because those kinds of negotiations don't happen overnight. Okay, thanks. So I do want to thank you both for taking on this heavy lift. This is, you know, as, as, as we do our own dive into the numbers, the, the task is formidable. And uh, we all hope you well and, and wish you well. Um, I'd like to, I just want to reconcile two different documents. If you could turn back to slide three. And up in the um, right-hand corner, you have two projected numbers for fiscal for 2019, uh, one without the increase and one with the increase. And um, in uh, adaptive, the information that you sent us uh, with adaptive, the 54 million 057 number included the $480,000 increase in the 5% in the, uh, commercial so, and if you look at the delta between, uh, on, on your chart, between the um, without increase and the with increase, that number is exactly 288,000. So I'm just wondering whether uh, there's been some double accounting here. Um, I've gone over this with our staff and it was a, was a, uh, a question that we couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. But it does appear to me that there might be about $488,000 of, of, of double accounting on the revenue number. Yeah, because the in, in adaptive um, <clears throat> with the um, I'm looking at the far right hand column that is clearly the uh, projection with with the increase mm -hmm. and you can see that the in, uh, net present revenue is 54 million 057 so it's just something to check um, um, but I, I couldn't I couldn't figure out how to tie those two together and, and neither could Lori or Agatha um, <clears throat> another in uh, so so many of these questions that I had have been answered. Um, it's, it's kind of a, Kevin and Jess and, and uh, Maureen do a great job. Um, the next one I had is uh, on payer mix. So I'm looking again on, on your adaptive payer mix table and just kind of trying to track how the, this is changing from where the budget started to where we are now. Um, in terms of, of, uh, of your mix of payers. And so in the original budget, the Medicaid revenue uh, was budgeted at, expected at uh, $12.4 million. And now that projection is down to $8.2 million. And for Medicare, the, the uh, uh, current projection is $17.1 million um, as compared to a budgeted amount of $22.4 million. Uh, on the other hand, the commercial side has gone up from uh, 25.2 million to 28.3 million uh, and to 28.8 million, inclusive of the rate increase at 488,000. So that puts your payer mixes migration from commercial from 42.8% to 53.2%, Medicaid from 19.3% down to 15.1% and Medicare from 37.9% down to 31.7%. And I'm just wondering uh, what thoughts you might have about this evolving uh, payer mix that may be helpful to you or may not be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to answer that at this point. <laughs> that I analyzed it some more. I just and they're all they look like they all dollar wise they all reduced because we know our volumes are down. But say that but again, the mix, the, the overall dollars are reduction look like on all three categories. But you're saying the mix percentage wise well, has changed between I mean, them. From where you started in budget, um, 
the uh, commercial mix has gone up both in percentage-wise and in dollar-wise. Um, from a, in a dollar perspective, it's gone from uh, a, a um, budgeted amount of 25.2 up to 28.8 million, and uh, inclusive of the of the rate increase. And I'm just, you know, this is the revenue side of of, of your operation, and I'm just wondering if if, if you think that this change in payer mix is helpful. Um, because there's more commercial, it's more heavily weighted toward commercial, or um, is it maybe not helpful because Springfield, um, you know, did have the highest percent of, of Medicaid of all payer mixes across the state just because of its demographics? I guess the, the best thing I can say right now is I would like to go back and relook at the projection numbers to make sure they're accurate. I'm not sure those are numbers are accurate. And those are the two questions I had left over after my uh, fellow board members preceded me. Okay, hey, Robin. Thank you. Nice to meet you, um, and thank you for coming today. Um, I had some questions on the staffing. Um, when I'm sorry, I have notes on two sets of present of your presentations, uh, so. It's going to take me a minute to get my stuff together. So on your slide 10, uh, where you have both the reduction in force and the turnover, um, you indicated that the turnover on this slide, because it's a savings, represents um, staff who've left but who you will not replace. Can you give us a sense of the turnover for staff that, who have left who you intend to replace, just in terms of how many folks are we talking? Um, to <coughs> basically, be, if I go back to this, sorry. Um, it's okay. Take your time. This one. Oh, perfect. Um, it would, in in general, high level, um, it would be everyone except for the administrative and the management personnel. Um, so, twenty five. We would try to do without um, 55 or so, 52, whatever that number differs in, would most likely be the uh, positions that we'd have to replace. We're we're running extremely tight right now in all of our uh, patient care areas in terms of staffing. We've, we've had a couple of days where we had to limit the number of admissions, and that's not what we want to do because yeah. that hurts the revenue side, obviously. Um, but we're not going to do anything um, that risks patient safety and patient care. So we're gonna, we'll have to cut back the number of patients we can admit if we don't have enough nurses on the floor. Thank you. So does this chart include both uh, the reduction in force as well as the voluntary resignations? Yes. Okay, thanks. I wasn't clear. Um, and so, to getting back to your discussion about um, needing to limit admissions, can you talk a little bit more about what you've had to do so far to manage to your staffing? Well, essentially, is uh, we've been able, to, we've been successful at convincing people to, to work extra shifts. Um, several of the of the people who left us because of the uncertainty of. The future of the organization has have been willing to come back and, and work per diem shifts for us. Um, so we're we're primarily sticking the finger in the dike by doing those kinds of measures of attracting people to come back on a per diem basis or um, to to work extra shifts. Um, and I think our leadership, uh, senior leadership in that nursing area, uh, has done just a, a phenomenal job in working with the the folks. Um, one of the things, if I can get away from from a quanti uh, quanti quantitative uh, comment to a qualitative comment, um, I don't think I've been at an organization, uh, and I've been, like I said, 40 years in healthcare, uh, in an organization that the staff so cares about each other. Um, in in all of my discussions that I've had with them, they truly, they say it and they truly mean it. They are a family. And, and so I've seen uh, nurses willing to take on additional uh, shifts um, uh, when it's not been in the best interest for them personally to do that. 
but they're willing to do it. They really care about the patients. They really care about the organization. They care about the people that they work with. So that's how we've been doing it. It's just kind of piecing it together. Um, we're hoping that by um, some of the actions that we, we took towards the end of February where we reinstated the nurses' salaries back then when we saw a lot of people departing. Um, and so we quickly shifted gears. And I took a little criticism for that because people said to me, do you know what you're doing? You know, you're announcing a reduction in salaries. Now, you're, you know, within a day, you're putting it back in there. Well, we had to do that, and, and it helped a little bit. Um, but it's a it's a day by day activity right now. Well, the Springfield community is very lucky to have such a dedicated staff of folks at the hospital. They are. Um, in terms of. Uh, I had another question about some of the uh, modeling that you've been working on. In your, in your January 9th letter to the governor, you indicated that you were going to look at some cost report modeling, um, and I'm assuming you're talking about the Medicare and Medicaid cost reports. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that modeling that you've been working on or other modeling um, to, to really kind of drill into the operational changes. Yeah, I think probably what I was referring to there is is Quorum has been successful uh, in providing us data uh, along service line analysis, um, and it uses a cost report as a, as a basis for doing that. Um, and it's a, a pretty sophisticated way that that's how we could identify that earlier number on the childbirth. Uh, it was a service line analysis work that we did there. Um, they also identified some other service lines that we don't believe we can get out of that service line, um, but we can tweak it a little bit. So uh, that's what we've been using to focus in and give us direction on where we need to um, hone in and, if I can use the term, peel the onion back a little bit um, by major service line areas. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Yep, no, you did. Thanks. Um, Sorry to jump around, but I'm, as Tom mentioned, folks have asked a lot of my questions as well. So I'm trying to just get down to the remaining few. Um, in terms of the expense reductions, uh, in your, in the Springfield Hospital financial statement audit from Barry Dunn, um, one of their notes, which is note 14, talks about, um, the Agency of Human Services advancing the 800,000 to the 800,000 to the hospital, um, fo following ratification by the board, the board of the hospital and SMCS of at least 6.5 million of specific savings to be implemented no later than April 1st, 2019. Um, I was, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about that because it looks like you've identified. Um, that amount in future savings, but uh, from your chart, I assumed the annualized figure really was looking more towards uh, the end of this calendar year. So I just wanted to check in with you about that to make sure that uh, we were still on track. Mm -hmm. Tom, did you want to? If, if he it does, he's got to get sworn in. Huh? So. So if you could get raise your hand and it's almost where for a film. It's just one about to get the truth, more truth, and I'm gonna the truth. I did. Tom Kuhner, H-U-E-E-N-E-R. I am a governor's representative in the Supreme Court of the We were part of that negotiation. It was not intended that those savings would be fully saved by April 1st, but that we would have identified annualized savings and steps taken to begin the implementation of April 1st. We did uncouple those by a little bit, um, uh, but it met the spirit of that agreement um, that we felt that uh, it was adequate. Thank you. So, uh, it was adequate. And you kind of do a follow-up question that's related to this question. It's up to Kevin. 
Well, since I just came from a dedication of the building in your honor and had a Tom Hooper sandwich, go ahead. <laughs> and I could never ask a question. I don't know the answer to what I'm going to. Can you go back to slide three? Slide three? Yeah. And you may be also the question of the The operating expenses when so in the projection of 61 million to 53. I understood you would say that was based on actual expenditures at the end of February. Well, I did, fall, I, I did fold in some of the savings that I knew at that time. Yeah, and that's sort of my point. If you then go ahead to the savings slide, Mike, it's seven and a half million annualized for the two slides. You have to add yeah. them together. The 2.2 2 million here are the end of fiscal year in the next slide. The 1.4, that's 3.6. Would that fully build into that projection? I think the answer is no. And that's really my point back. Um, if I could, just uh, by way of comment, the, the state of Vermont has been obviously very interested from the governor's office and the secretary of the agency and what's going on here. Um, we've done really three or four things uh, on behalf of the governor. One was strongly to encourage the board to hire the staff. Um, and I hope you have a sense, I, I've come to have a sense, that these people are honorable, free, thoughtful, experienced people that they are. Um, we second encourage them to make really hard decisions. And they're doing it. I'm not saying that they're all done yet. Well, at this point, I think there still may be more might to extend um, in order to do that. I've seen the projections for the cash flow for evidence getting into balance. Um, they're still being refined and solidified, but I'm frankly quite hopeful about those. And that's a good sign in my view. But as Mike said, that does not get us the profitability on a, on a uh, street elevator. And that does require further steps, and it requires a partner. And those are ongoing right now. And I personally am cautiously optimistic about that. And it hasn't happened in a very, very um, still uh, fragile situation, to say the least. But I think I see, I know Mike does, see a path forward that can be successful. Um, and that we frankly think is going to a community to go. Um, not done yet, but I do think there's a way through this. And we are looking for a little bit of help from these guys, obviously, today, to um, help us get another step along the way. Not out of the woods, but a step. Before I turn it back over to Robin, and since people may watch this later on on ORCA and may not understand what EBITDA is, it's basically a cash flow and it's earnings before interest, depreciation, taxes, and amortization. So it basically isn't what you would see on an audit statement, but it, it's an accurate indicator of the actual cash flow going through the institution. So, Robin? I just have one last question, um, which is related to slide 13 with the other strategies and activities. Um, and to um, Maureen's point that she made earlier, um, at what point do you start looking at even more aggressive uh, strategic planning? For example, really drilling into which service lines and services absolutely are essential to the community and is there a different way to provide those services in a less expense in intensive manner uh, understanding that you're pursuing these these may do the job uh, if a relationship comes through that obviously um, as Tom said could uh, turn things around but should should these all fail at what point do you start looking to a more uh, I'll use the word creative solution to address the community needs. 
Well, let, let me tell you what my thought is, um, and, and that is we're, we are basically approaching this simultaneously. We're looking at those services, um, but difficult to pull the trigger until you're having conversation with the partner, because the partner may have a different opinion as the kind of services that they think we ought to have. And, and so we're working on it simultaneously in, in hopes that that partner will come to the table. Um, but in terms of timetable, I, I think if, if we don't have um, some kind of a really strong commitment from a partner by the end of May, then we're looking at pulling the trigger on those other uh, service line things uh, to try to, to stay as you know, independent and survive the best we can. But we'll know what those service lines are um, because we're working on them simultaneously with the other effort. Thank you. So a couple more questions. Um, what is your continuing um, obligation with the Springfield Recreation Center? Uh, I don't, uh, the, the existing uh, relationship is that we own the building. Uh, 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 Springfield Medical Care uh, Systems owns the building. I, I think it's SMCS that owns the building and we lease it to the operating company that operates the rec organization. And so we're basically a landlord. Lease payments? I'm sorry? Are they current on their lease payments? Yes. Okay. To my knowledge, they are, yeah. Good. And vendors and suppliers, are you seeing any flight? <laughs> um, I'll let you answer that because you deal with it 24 by 7. Could you repeat your question? On yeah. vendors and suppliers, are you seeing any flight? Flight? Uh, I wouldn't use that term. Uh, they're pressing for payments every day. Uh, but you, you're still receiving supplies? We are, but you know there are some vendors that, as an example, will not ship today's supply until we pay the invoice from two months ago in an equal dollar amount. So we're working with those kind of vendors. And then when some of the large national vendors have required us to have a specific amount paid weekly to them in order to keep the supplies flowing. So, um, you know, it's it's a day-to-day -day challenge cash flow-wise to, to provide what the vendors want. Um, I could give a long answer, but that's the short answer. Okay. But you're, you're able to cobble together sufficient supplies to meet the needs. I believe we are, unless Mike is hearing something different from the managers. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board? If not, I'm going to ask Agatha and Lori if they have any questions before I turn it over to the public. Okay. Thank you. So at this time, we'll open it up to uh, public uh, questions or comments that should be directed through me. And. Uh, <laughs> See if I can read the writing. I'm not sure if it's Ted or Jed Cody. Oh, no. Okay. Okay, got it. So Marvin Malik. Did you have you had written down public comment? Shortages of nursing staffing, we have limited the capacity of, of the number of patients we can accept under the medical surgical unit where I work. And uh, I'm one of the many providers, I'm a physician on the hospitalist team, and I am taking more shifts than I want to. So I'm doing my part to try to keep things going until we can have luck with recruiting. But I do want to say about recruiting that I really think it would be a really good investment for the state as a whole to develop a Vermont Health Jobs website where every physician practice, every hospital could post a job. I don't think it would, I don't even know if it would take one full FTE to run such a website and put out enough publicity so that people around the country know about it because our, we are getting killed on recruiting costs. It's painful to me. One of the reasons I work is because I know so I didn't agree to work some other shifts that the administrators were trying to get me to work. And I know, that, I know exactly how much the person who's going to work that shift is earning. It's 
$1,200 a day extra every single day that I say no, and I feel terrible about it. And these recruiting firms, are they basically have a functioning cartel. They all charge almost exactly the same thing, and it's a lot of money. It's, it's nearly double what, what the staff, regular staff members earn. The same firms also work as recruiters, and the standard charge if they identify a physician who signs a two-year contract is $40,000 one-time fee. And that's a lot of money. And I, and I think that if the state of Vermont, I don't know which agency would do it, but I think if the state of Vermont took that on, those little $40,000 payments add up. And the same website could do short-term employment too, and we could offer amounts of money that are more reasonable. So, you know, you talk about cutting services, but I'm looking at the day-to-day -day accru accrual of expenses and revenue. You talk about cutting service lines. What do we do? There's not that much done at Springfield. It's primary care and it's basic hospital care. Because of shortages in nursing and nursing staff over staff turnover, I'm really worried that our surgical volumes are going to, our surgical revenue may really drop because they don't have teams that they, that on many days that they feel comfortable to really provide the pa patient care at the standard they want. So they limit, they're very strategic about which days they may do an operation and we really need high quality staffing. And I, I think one of the biggest mistakes the hospital made was to get rid of its ICU uh, six, five or six years ago because then the surgeons felt comfortable. They felt like they had the team. And uh, so, and I guess the last thing I'll say now, I may, I may want to say more later if you'll allow me, but one of the things I strongly encourage you to do, or two more things, one of the things has to deal with software. In 2012, I met with several members of the Green Mountain Care Board at different times. They were following the rules about public meetings and uh, encouraged them that they set a deadline of eight or 10 years to have a single software system for the state. And I'll, they didn't do it. And now we're sitting there with multiple different softwares. That the software in our emergency department has, is completely not communicating with the software on the medical floor. That, in turn, doesn't communicate with any referral, also with anyone in Florida who, for snowbirds who may be coming up. So we rely heavily on fax machines, even, in, even, even internally. It's a struggle for us to get all the information we want to in a timely fashion. The clinics even use a different form of software. The solution to this was going to have a very expensive vendor, who, software vendor, who was going to charge us a lot of money, but at least we'd have a single system. So this is an outflow of money that, to me, is as painful to watch as the recruiting costs are. And I think if the state at some point, if the Green Mountain Care Board and the leadership of the state says, we have a 10-year plan, we're really, you know, make the CEOs come to the table and come up with a plan so that we're going to do something with software that will, will work for the, uh, those of us who are trying to provide the care to our patients. I need to know what's going on at UVM when they're there or at Dartmouth, and I can't now. And uh, it's just, this is not working out. One of the other things I would say is that I hope that you get residency-based data on health care expenditures for Wyndham and Windsor County and see if the drops in our revenue are going to translate into lower overall health care spending. And I worry they will not. In fact, I worry it may be the opposite. So if these people are going to end up at Dartmouth, I, we may even see more revenue, more costs. So this is one of my big worries. You may want the work done at Springfield. And so, anyway, those are my comments. Thank you for taking them. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Dr. Malik. And as, as usual, your comments are, are uh, very well. And, um, you know, I think back uh, to the days when we were first talking about uh, VITAL and efforts by those of us in the legislature to try to dictate that it would be a common software and being told that um, federal laws prohibited that. And so I, I can see that, uh, I see the frustration in your voice and I share it because if we had only had one system, if the state had only gone out and bought the system for everybody, 
we would be so much further ahead today. You're absolutely right. And so I, I just say that I share your frustration. And, uh, you know, workforce is something that is, I think, the biggest crisis in the state of Vermont. And if we don't start figuring out how to turn out more doctors and nurses within our own state's education system through the state colleges and universities, we're in trouble. So, other questions or comments from the public? Ham. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to talk to ask Mike and, and also maybe talk. I'm sorry. Hamilton Davis. Yes, that, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if you could uh, talk, ask the, the, uh, Mr. Halstead and if it's also involved what Tom had to say. Um, the obvious issue here is whether it's a park. And if, if, if we clearly need a partner, then the question is, the obvious question is, well, who is the partner? And the obvious partner that would be the best is Dr. Hitchcock. And I, I think that's just pretty obvious. And what I'm curious about is, in the buzz, which is not official in any way, what we heard was that Dartmouth has told Springfield that they have to go through Chapter 11 before they'd, become, they'd be willing to sit down and really decide what to do next. Um, and I'd like to, I wonder if you could talk about that. Is there some, is, is, what is the real world chance for a partner and what is at stake? We'd also get to Maureen's question because, and, and the question of debt as over against expenses. If I understand, if I understand chapter 11 correctly, which I may not, the, uh, the, the once you, if you go into chapter 11, the main protection you get in that, in that process is protection from your debt. Thank you. So, Mike, you know, you have to protect the uh, organization that you're working for. And I don't know if you feel it's an appropriate question for you to answer when it comes to those two questions, which really were about bankruptcy filing and uh, a possible future affiliation. So I'll leave it up to you if you want sure. to say anything. Yeah, let me, let me try to address it this way. Um, I think first, relative to the partner, um, Anyone that we spoke to very early in the process um, said, you know, you, you have some financial challenges that you have to really wrestle with. Um, we've wrestled with some of those. Haven't done it all. Uh, as Tom mentioned, we still have a ways to go. Um, so what our intent is now is to go back to those people that we spoke to, Dartmouth being one of them, and, said, and, and, and say to them, uh, okay, here are some of the things that we're doing, and we're beginning to show the results of those. Um, March results are much better than they've been in months and months and months in terms of the operations. Um, maybe um, their perspective on the situation will change as a result of that. Um, don't know. I can't speak for any other partners on how they'll uh, view it differently, um, but I believe they will. So I think there'll be a stronger interest um, than the initial comment to us was, you know, you got to straighten out your financial situation first. Um, relative to Chapter 11, um, that, that's always a strategy that we've looked at from the moment I got here uh, in the organization. Uh, that is one strategy that an organization can take. Um, um, but with that kind of a filing, and that kind of a process, you have to be able to show that, that you're a going concern after you come out of that process. Um, and so, you know, every day we're still working on that and fine tuning that. Um, and, and so, has a decision been made to do any kind of filing? Not yet, because we don't know how we would fare during that, that filing process. Um, but each day that goes on, we get a better view of the future. Uh, what our changes are going to produce, uh, and what our position is going to be. Um, and it's probably going to be a combination of those strategies, like I said earlier, partner, partnering with some kind of a filing. Um, there, isn't, there isn't anyone out there that we're aware of, and we'd sure love to know the name of it, who would come in with their open checkbook and, and fix us. We're going to have to make every effort we can to fix ourselves. Uh, but by doing that, we become much more attractive to a partner. 
So Ham, it's clear that there are different types of filings that can be filed under the federal bankruptcy law. And um, one of them that really is a dissolution, and, and nobody wants that outcome. And Mike is completely accurate that when you're trying to do a restructuring, you have to have a solid plan where a judge has belief that at the end of the day you're coming out and you're going to be sustainable in the future. So I'm sure that there's still a lot more work to be done before any type of decisions could be made. Other questions or comments from the public? Jeff. Um, Mr. Chairman, is there going to be another opportunity? This is the public comment as okay. it co goes to enforcement. We could, we can, but you can see that clearly everything is interrelated. Right. So um, just, just a couple quick um, notes of thank you, really. Yes, my name is Jeff Tiemann, T-I-E-M-A-N, with the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Um, and I just want just a couple thank yous, really. Um, I want to thank Mike and Wayne for, for coming to Vermont and, and doing yeoman's work to try to turn around a struggling institution that matters to our entire state and doing so responsibly and ethically um, and, and smartly. So, so thank you, as well to Josh Dufresne, um, who continues to um, work at Springfield with, with the commitment of someone who's been in that community for his entire life and is working hard to, to right the institution as well. Also to thank um, Tom Huebner for his work, um, having been appointed by the governor to serve as a liaison. Um, no one better in the state to do that. I think all of us would agree, and so just to, to thank Tom Huebner for his work. Um, and then Steve Gordon, who's here as well from Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, for stepping in to help with OB services and perinatal care to ensure continued access for women in the community. And then last but not least, to thank the board. This is a really hard set of questions and considerations, and we appreciate your thoughtful um, attention to, to this set of issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Other public uh, comments or questions? Dr. Malik? Yeah. <laughs> Just a couple of more things. I, with the elimination of our child care unit uh, and obstetrical activity at our facility, we worry that it's, it's one of its ultimate effects will be losing pediatrics and gynecologic care making young people view Springfield a little less favorably as a place to move to. So that's, that has worried the community. And I guess my question is, uh, what role, okay, so you have a certificate of need process when an institution wants to add a facility. So for example, Rutland Hospital is now putting in a specialty, a huge specialty facility. And yeah, they're calling it the Hugh. Right. And uh, what about a process when a community wants to get, when a hospital is proposing to get rid of a potentially valuable service? And I guess my comment to you is, for your consideration, is whether there ought to be a process that does involve the representatives of the public in the form of you, the Green Mountain Care Board. So that's one question. And the other I have is about uh, the role of Dartmouth. Dartmouth is very good about accepting, is very tuned into, functionally, is very tuned into getting procedures done that get them a lot of revenue and then they'll often send patients back. We tend to get less help when we have a complex medical patient that doesn't, who doesn't need any procedures in terms of them being able to accept a patient who may need multi-specialty care. So I just wonder the two parts of that is the, uh, that it doesn't seem that the incentives have changed. We, we have an unfavorable payer mix, and when you talk about eliminating service lines, we have an unfavorable service mix. We're not providing procedures that, uh, that much elective orthopedics or gyneco uh, elective gynecology, elective type procedures that still, despite years of talking about payment reform, Despite all that talk, it had nothing that has really changed. When I provide care to a profoundly deconditioned or overweight person who has cellulitis and we need a lot of care just to move the patient around, just to get through the day and prevent pressure sores from developing, we're losing money on that. Whereas if I come in, have a little wrist operation to the orthopedics department, 
that Rutland's putting in or that Burlington or Dartmouth have, that's quick revenue. The charges and the revenue are much greater than the cost of providing the service. So there aren't any service lines. All of ours are unfavorable. From, and nothing much changed in terms of the payment reform. So I'm just wondering how the Green Mountain Care Board views that. And then the final question uh, in terms of the role of the Green Mountain Care Board is delegating a lot of responsibility to an out-of-state institution in the form of Dartmouth and the comfort level with doing that and how well they'll represent the interests of the population of Vermont. So you'd get five different opinions depending on which one of us answered this question, but I can tell you that um, I think that obviously we would prefer to keep services in the community whenever possible. We want services to be in the right setting so that uh, people aren't driving in an inordinate amount of time. Um, when it comes to uh, a reduction in services, nobody would like to see a reduction in a birthing unit. We wish that the population was growing in Vermont. On the same token, tough decisions have to be made, and you know I commend people for making very hard decisions because if you don't make those hard decisions, then ultimately the institution fails. And you know when Jeff Tiemann stood up, the the one entity he forgot to thank was Vaz and what they have done is all the hospitals in that region have gotten together and worked on contingency plans on how to make sure that the people who are getting care for in the Springfield region would, um, in a worst case scenario, still make sure that they had care. And Steve Gordon is here, and I know that Steve is committed to making sure that um, families in Springfield get the type of um, gynecological care and such so that birthings go smoothly and you know Steve I don't want to put you on the spot do you want, but do you want to say anything would you like to do <laughs> I'm good uh, Steve Gordon you are here from uh, Fred Bar Memorial Hospital first I want to commend Mike and his team and, and Josh um, when we first started hearing about the issues at, um, uh, at Springfield I reached out uh, to Josh and, and Mike and um, uh, to come up with a plan if they had made it or the board was making a decision to close the OB unit there, how we can help. And our, um, we have four obstetricians in a full midwifery program. And what we put out for, for um, the Springfield board to consider is for us to establish a, a site uh, in Springfield where we would keep as much of the services as possible with the exception of deliveries. And those deliveries would be in uh, a proud of us. Um, and uh, just last week we were there, Josh shared with us a uh, uh, great location for office space. So it's really a commitment of, of the hospital, the, the commitment of our OBGYN physicians and, and our midwives uh, to that community to get to keep as much of the services within that community. Um, or, you know, docs are applying for GYN surgical privileges for those OB patients that require or we'd like to have GYN services uh, by our physicians in, in Springfield, uh, ultrasound, um, uh, laboratory services, as many as the services that we can support uh, for Springfield. It's 45 minutes, whether it's 45 minutes to us in Brattleboro or 45 minutes uh, to uh, Dartmouth Pitchcock with other people. Um, so our, our commitment um, is to uh, keep as many of those services in that community to help that community and to sustain um, a hospital at some level. Um, and I think, you know, that's the kind of, uh, through Jeff and especially through Tom, that's what we're trying to do from a, a, a neighboring hospital standpoint. And I knew others, as well as Dartmouth, um, are um, looking at what other services would be provided. But part of that is taking Mike's lead and really the board of Springfield, um, understanding what how they see the future of that hospital, what it might look like. As we've all talked about, we're going to look different. And I remember Maureen at our last Green Mountain Care Board meeting, our presentation, um, you made some comments about, you know, um, our efficiencies. And I said, well, one of the most inefficient areas is OB. Right? 
we talked about that. Um, so here we have a situation where another hospital has closed it, so we will be closing it, um, and we're working together to make that um, a, some type of sustainable service in that community. So these are all the questions that every hospital um, are going to experience, as every small hospital is going to experience. It's very difficult. But um, glad we're in Vermont because it's a collaborative process, collaborative communication, and collaboration as opposed to competitive um, situation amongst the hospitals. And uh, so I thank Tom, too, as well, uh, uh, with the governor um, on, uh, on, um, on some of these things. Thank you, Steve. And I think that's everybody's goal, is to keep the patient first and in the minds of moving forward to make sure the right care is happening and as much as possible right in the Springfield community. So is there anyone else who has any public comment or questions? Okay, seeing none. Um, Lori and Agatha, do you wish to come back up? Thank you, Mike and Wayne. Um, we are ready to uh, have enforcement deliberation with uh, the board. And um, we present the same similar slides to the other hospitals that we had presentations. We like to emphasize the enforcement mechanism that the board is working with for um, this particular fiscal year, 18. And then we also um, like to mention that the FY 2020 budget, budget guidance for hospitals with actual fiscal year 2018 and projected fiscal year 2019 MPR FPP that is at least 2% below budgeted MPR FPP, the GMCB expects MPR FPP and expenses in the fiscal year 2020 budget submission to align with the hospital's actual fiscal year 2018 and projected fiscal year 2019 results. For these hospitals, the GMCB would not expect to see MPR FPP more than 5% greater than projected fiscal year 2019 NPR FPP unless there is a clear explanation and documentation describing why a larger increase in MPR FPP is justified. For hospitals with projected fiscal year 2019 NPR FPP that is greater than budgeted, the GMCB would not expect to see fiscal year 2020 NPR FPP greater than 3.5% unless clearly justified. This information is, is in our hospital budget guidance for 2020. And if you have any questions, um, staff will gladly help you. We have seen, um, we are, had enforcement deliberation on all these hospitals, Cop and Copley, Northwestern, North Country, Gifford, and Mount Scutney were seen the previous week. So this week we are talking with Springfield. Staff recommend no rebase, rebases. The board should consider the following factors. For fiscal year 2020 budget guidance, we'll take into consideration fiscal year 2019 projections, the hospital's historical operating margin, and specific causes of variance considered to be short-term. Specific causes of variance considered to be short-term. Staff recommend continue monthly monitoring of hospitals through reporting, and some hospitals will be required to provide in-person updates to GMCB staff. For Springfield enforcement, we were looking at their budget to actual present variance for fiscal year 2018 was a negative 10.8% and the actual to actual percent change was 1.9%. This is for the NPR and FPP. For their fiscal year 2019 year to date as of February, 
the budget to actual variance was a negative 5.4%, and their actual to actual percent change was 1.6%. We also showed the operating margin. Um, we had showed these in the previous slides, but the operating margins were from fiscal year 2014 through 20, actual 2018, and we're also showing year-to-date 2019, and then the budget for fiscal year 2019. So for fiscal year 2014, <coughs> the hospital was showing a negative 3.7, over 3.7 million loss uh, from their operating margin. For fiscal year 15 was a positive $2.3 million um, operating income. For fiscal year 2016 was 181,122. For their actuals, 2017 was a negative three point over $3.8 million loss. For fiscal year 18, this year under discussion, was almost $7 million loss in their operating margin. And year to date, uh, February is uh, negative 1.9 million. There were they're budgeting 810,362. Underneath that is their percentage for their operating margins. The staff recommend no enforcement, including no rebase. Expectation is hospital will comply with fiscal year 2020 budget guidance. We're looking to the board to ask if there's any other monitoring that they would want or any other considerations. And also a possible vote. So similar to the other uh, hospitals on the previous slide, um, we would be looking for monthly monitoring, which would involve either a, a phone call um, or an in-person meeting, Mike, between you or Wayne and myself or members of the Green Mountain Care Board staff. So, Maureen, would you like to make a motion? Uh, sure. Um, I'd like to make a motion that for Springfield Hospital, we have no enforcement, including no rebase, and that there are monthly in-person or via phone meetings for monitoring for the rest of the fiscal year. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion among the board? I had a question about um, the monitoring. Um, we had sent, well, Kevin, you had sent on everyone's behalf a letter in January that outlined the um, enhanced monitoring that we were asking for specifically. Um, and Maureen, you had just mentioned a few other things earlier in the discussion that we might want to see. And I just wanted to check and make sure that what we're currently getting, getting is inclusive enough or whether we would need to, whether there's any other monitoring that we would want. At any point, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Well, that answers my question. We're not limited by whatever we vote on today. We can always change the monitoring if needed. So that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just like to point out that, you know, part of the rationale for not having a rebase is, um, you know, some of the administrative burden that may put on a hospital. The expectation is that since right now you're trending about 5% below your budget, that when you come in for your 2020 budget, that it will at most be only 5% over where your actuals are trending. And we are going to put a lot of pressure and questions on making sure the forecast that you're coming in with is is trending accurately. And if that were to be the case right now, then you would have a flat year over year to budget, but you would be up slightly year over year over the prior year, which is where you've been about up two percent prior year. So, you know, that was really put in place to prevent having to people to go in and reforecast everything, but really focusing not just on the budget, but on actuals as well and where you're trending. Anybody else? Yeah, I would just uh, add to Maureen's comment that if you take, take uh, as uh, the, the current projections, you know, for 2019, including the 488,000 and in, in, in with an increased 
it leads to the revenue estimate that uh, the Springfield folks presented earlier at 54057 and a 5% increase over that is takes them to 56760 which is still a very, very heavy lift um, given the circumstances. So I, I think that you know, by taking this action, the board has put enough constraint and pressure you know, on the system, um, but also keeping in mind that uh, you know, the uh, NPR 56.7 million um, is uh, still uh, quite a bit higher than it was in 2017, where they, uh, which, which was an actual that they faced. So it, it, uh, it does keep hope alive, I think. My hope is that we have Springfield in front of us for many, 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 many more budget years to come. So any further discussion? Seeing, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, with that, we're going to turn to um, the budget adjustment request. We received a budget adjustment request from Springfield on March 27th, and we presented it to the board on March 27th. Um, the request is for a 5% increase in the hospital's average charges, effective May 1st, 2019. The increase in fiscal year 2019 MPR FPP is estimated at $488,924. The annualized increase is estimated at $1,173,417. The hospital's board of trustees authorized the request at its March 12, 2019 meeting. The reasons for the request include their financial health, which is showing negative operating margins for fiscal year 17 and 18 and continuing in fiscal year 2019, despite cost containment efforts and cash position is tenuous at best. They recently terminated their childbirth services and reduced FTEs and salaries for a number of employees. The, um, as of last year, when they submitted their budget, they had a proposed budget of uh, approximately $60 million. And for fiscal year 18 through 19, their proposed NPR FPP growth was 1% or 621755 Their fiscal year 19 submitted change in charge request was 5%. They are participating in all payers for the ACO for 2018 and 19. The approved budget for was on September 12th, and the board approved their $60 million um, budget and approved the 5% change in charge. The budget modification before you is to, re is, which was received on the 27th, is for fiscal year 19 change in charge, requested increase of 5% to 10%, effective no earlier than May 1st, 2019. So summary, the uh, financial indicators that we have year to date for fiscal year 19, as of February, is the operating margin was a negative 7.9%. Their total margin was a negative 12.7%. The day's cash on hand was 9.4%. Days payable was 85.5. Days receivable was 62.3. So um, in the chart, we're, we're showing the commercial cha charge increase at their budget time was 5%. And of course, participating in all payers for the ACO, and the board had decided to increase their change in charge to 5%. And now we're asking for the change in charge to increase to 10%. And um, this will be an operating loss of $1,922,875. And this is to help with the financial, they have a financial solvency risk. So this is um, asking for a vote on this increase in charge. So the staff is recommending the 5% uh, increase in? Yes, we are. Okay. Questions from the board for the staff? Seeing none, what do you want? I'm trying to decide <laughs> if I have a question or not. Um, I, 
I'm not sure if this is a question for staff, but maybe I'll ask it and then we can see what, what makes sense. Um, I assume that we've confirmed that the payer contracts allow for a change in charge to flow through at this time. So Wayne, have you got the additional confirmations necessary? Uh, most of the insurance companies that I contacted said they wanted to wait to see what the Green Act Care Board was going to allow before they would even negotiate with me. So the simple answer is no, I don't, I don't know what they're going to allow. Uh, Blue Cross is the biggest payer that we have. Um, so just reading between the lines, it sounded like they were open to the idea, but they wanted to hear what the, what the decision was going to be made here before they even Okay, there's nothing in your contracts that would forbid it, correct? There are some, some contracts have like a four and a half to five percent rate increase annually. One other insurance company that I talked to directly told me that they'd be happy to give it to me, but then there wouldn't be anything to come out for the term. It would take the place of this next year's rate increase. So that was the answer I got from them, and then I learned later that they're a very small part of our business. It okay. What a big effect for them either. So. Do you have a follow-up, Robin? No, that's not good. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Is there anything, Mike or Wayne, that you wish to say in addition? Okay. Um, before I open it up to the public, before we have a deliberation, I just want to uh, say that uh, my biggest fear is flight of people from Springfield to other institutions. And I just hope that the community itself can rally and come together and the word can be spread throughout the community that every time they go to Springfield versus someplace else, they've actually done something to save their hospital and to keep those services in their community. So. Um, it, with that being said, uh, I do worry sometimes that that number might be overly optimistic what the revenue might be bringing in, but I, I do think that uh, everybody in Vermont should be trying to give Springfield a, the biggest chance that they can be given. So with that, I'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Seeing, oh, yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I just wonder uh, the extent of which uh, a change like this would mesh, if you will, with uh, fixed-price contracts through the, uh, the all-payer model uh, with one thing. So, I, I, do you want me to go ahead. try to answer that? Because the, fixed price, the charge increase really just applies to commercial, and the commercial agreement, and Mike can correct me if I go astray, but the commercial agreement is still an underlying fee-for-service basis, so I think that uh, it would basically um, would be something that the, that One Care and Blue Cross in relationship to Springfield would have to work out in terms of the benchmark, but I think um, since the fixed prices are really just in Medicare and Medicaid and those aren't impacted by a charge increase, there's no direct so there's no, no actual risk to Blue Cross? Well, there, you mean to one care, because it would be yeah. one care that would be well, at no, risk. Well, the, the, the hospital would be at risk of risk. Right. I mean, I think that's something that they they would need to work out on the Blue Cross side, but Blue Cross doesn't have the fixed payments in the same way that Medicare and Medicaid do. It's still shared savings and losses. And there would be a separation between fixed prospective payments and those that are still, those charges that are still related to fee for service. I'll I'll withdraw the question. I mean, I just think that there's a question there about it's certainly shadow. There definitely is a question. It's a very yeah. good question. There's obviously a shadow. There's obviously shadow fee for service data that's collected. But I didn't know the what the uh, your, your staff said that 50 percent of the Blue Cross uh, contract. Um, were within in a risk form. Now, that may be wrong, I don't, but but the uh, uh, if the hospital, I think 
Springfield is taking risk on, on all three payers, or all Medicare, Medicaid, and Blue Cross. If we're taking them on Blue Cross, I'm not sure. If, if, if they're not taking risk, well, that's the answer. But then the question is. So I, I, I would doubt that a member of the staff said that 50% of Blue Cross contracts are are at risk. Um, there might be a misunderstanding of what the question was. It may have related to strictly QHP, I'm not sure, but I, I don't think that, at least I would hope nobody would say that 50% of the Blue Cross contracts are in a risk arrangement, because that is not the case. Other comments or questions from the public? Seeing none, is there a board member who wishes to make a motion? I'll move that we approve the uh, additional 5% increase in charges, effective no earlier than May 1st. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the additional 5% uh, increase in charges, effective May 1st. 2019 is there any discussion uh, yeah I just want to point out I mean I will support this motion but we can't you know find our way there by increases on commercial you know and I just want to be on record of saying that because several of the hospitals in the state are struggling and we're not going to get to profitability by just doing commercial increases um, because of one, you know, some of the points that that Ham's making, you know, but secondarily, a 10% increase uh, for people of high deductible plans, you know, they're going to be paying more. So we're, you know, shifting some of that obviously to consumers as well. And we need to be cognizant of that. I mean, I think in the situation that you're in right now, and we're trying to pull all the levers that we can to help turn around, that you know, it will be supported to do go for 10% for the full year. But you know, this is not a tactic that's going to get us there in the future or get you guys out. So, Tom. I would just like to um, add to Maureen's observation um, that if you accept the the payer mix as most recently presented uh, by Springfield, um, that payer mix uh, with uh, this increase would um, for commercial would go um, from 25.2 million to 28.8 million, an increase. But but the Medicaid expected rev Medicaid revenue has dropped from 12.4 million down to 8.2 million, and the projected uh, Medicare has dropped from 22.4 million to 17.1 million. So those payers uh, from, uh, you know, their obligation is weakened uh, while we are strengthening you know, the expectations out of the commercial payer, and in the long run, that is a cost shift that just cannot be sustained. One comment, but do you want, do you want go to go ahead? Okay. Um, I totally agree with what uh, Maureen and Tom have said, and I and I do think um, this this will solve the problem in in a long term. It's not a strategy that will solve the problem in a long term fashion. And in fact, depending on how successful the hospital is able to be with the commercial payers, may not even solve the problem in the short term. Um, so I think it's what the lever that we happen to have in the hospital budget process that we can pull to help uh, support the hospital in the situation. Uh, we don't have a lot of other levers um, in our toolbox to assist in this, in this particular uh, issue and problem. Um, but I think it's important for us to just acknowledge that this lever has a limited usefulness and is a limited tool. So I would echo the, the fact that it's a limited tool. It doesn't create a lot of revenue. Um, in many respects, I wish that we were getting more help from our friends across the street because just the reduction in dish payment in the last few years has been about a million dollars for Springfield Hospital. and That could make an even bigger impact on this. But 
with that being said there's a motion in front of us if there's no further discussion all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye aye, aye. any opposed thank you thank you mike and wayne we hope it wasn't too painful good so is there any old business to come before the board seeing none is there any new business to come before the board Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a